Hello and welcome to Show and Tell with me, Stephen Leslie, the series where I show you some photos and then brace yourself, go on to tell you about them. Um, and this is episode 18. And uh, I'm going to start by reading you out a list of photographers. And I want you to see if you can tell me uh, what you think they all have in common. So here we go. Um, in alphabetical order, Diane Arbus, Richard Avenden, Brill Bat. Bill Brill Brandt, Bill Brandt, Walker Evans, Robert Frank, Bruce Gilden, Andre Cortez, Sergio Lorraine, Herbert List, Marquetta Luskakova, Mary Ellen Mark, Lizette Modell, Paul McDonough, Joel Meyerwitz, Paul Strand, August Sander, Edith Tudor Hart, and Gary Winogrand. And that's just uh, a fraction of the relevant people that I am want to talk about today. Um, so what do they all have in common? I was going to try and introduce an element of suspense into all this by saying I'll tell you after the titles, but then I realised that the title has to have uh, the subject of the programme in it, and therefore that will just give it away. And you've anyway, it, you'll probably, if you look at the YouTube column, you'll see what this one is about anyway. Anyway, so the thing that links all of those photographers is that at one time or another they have all photographed the same subject and what is that subject they have all photographed blind people and that's what i'm going to look at today uh photographing the blind so let's do the titles and then we can talk about that in some more detail <laughs> So this is another one of those subjects that started out by me just noticing that lots of the photographers whose work I was looking at seem to have pictures of photographs of blind people amongst their work. And I thought that this was worthy of a bit of deeper investigation, because when you think about it, there's something slightly unsettling going on here, because photography, after all, is all about sight, isn't it? Uh, Walker Evans, who was a very eloquent man, said that the matter of art in photography may come down to this. It is the capture and projection of the delights of seeing. So there's something slightly perverse or maybe just slightly unfair in so many great photographers taking so many photos of blind people who can never delight in seeing. So I thought it would be worth uh, seeing, there's that word again, today, uh, what we can glean from looking a bit closer at some of those photographs and what they might tell us about photography and its relationship to blindness. Um, now, I was going to do this in strictly chronological order, but then I realised that there are some sort of slightly more interesting unchronological groupings. So uh, this episode might jump about chronologically a little bit, but I'm sure you're big and uh, strong enough to handle that. Um, now, why are there so many photographs of blind people? Well, the basic reason is that uh, certainly in the past, blind people um, had no real option but to go out into public and to uh, beg in order to survive. That's one of the cruel realities um, of, 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 of the situation. And um, as you'll see from looking at these photographs, some of them have some things in common. Um, the earliest one that I can find is this one by the American photographer Jacob Rees and it was taken in 1888, so it's over 130 years old. And you can see the blind beggar here with his little cigar box to uh, receive any money, and I think that he's selling pencils. What I like about this photo is that obviously Reese would have been shooting with a very slow, cumbersome old film camera, and so most of the background and foreground is blurry and out of focus. It's as if our vision is also coming under attack or going out of focus in sympathy. And just to make it even better, check out the shop in the background here. It's selling looking glasses. So not only is this possibly the earliest blind beggar shot, but it's also one of the earliest juxtaposition shots you're ever likely to find anywhere. Now, virtually all of the other blind beggar shots that I found fall into one of two categories. Um, and the first category that we're going to look at is signs. And the earliest sign photograph I can find is this one by Paul Strand. And this was taken in New York City in 1916. Now there's no denying that this is an incredibly powerful and memorable photograph. The woman here is totally blind, even though her left eye is open and seemingly looking off out of frame. And she's got an official New York City licensed peddler's badge there above her sign. So she's almost a professional blind person. This is how she makes her living. And there's also an interesting story attached to it 
which is that Strand was grappling with a problem that still applies to many photographers today, which is that he was keen to try and take more photos on the street without people noticing him. He said in an interview that he gave much later that he felt that the best photographs have a quality of being when the person doesn't know they are being photographed. And to that end, Strand did something rather sneaky when he went out on the street with his camera, is that he stuck um, a fake lens onto the side. This, this wasn't the kind of camera he was using. He was using a much bigger uh, plate camera, I think, but this is what I've got to, to demonstrate with. But he would stick a fake lens onto the side of his camera and then he would pretend to be shooting one way when actually he was trying to get whoever was standing at right angles to him like that. So I don't know who fell for it, but um, he obviously managed to do it a few times and got some great results. Yeah, so obviously in this case, with this photograph, he didn't need to resort to such subterfuge because his subject can't see him anyway. And this is surely a big appeal of shooting photographs of blind people because to them, the street photographer truly is invisible. So I'm going to show you a few more photographs of blind people with signs now. Um, and in each case, I would argue that the sign itself is just as important as the person. In fact, there's even a way of reading these photographs whereby we are slightly embarrassed to look at the face of the blind person. And so we take refuge in the sign instead. The first one is this by Herbert List from 1936. And his sign reads, totally blind. And unlike Paul Strand's earlier photo, there are no open eyes here. This man has both of his tight shut, if indeed he does have eyes. The blind sign is not a purely British or American phenomenon, of course. This is a photo that Lisette Medel took in Paris in the 1930s that reads, and I'm going to mangle my pronunciation here, avougle, which means blind in French. And then immediately underneath it says, I have been like this since one year old, but then it gets a bit tricky. My French isn't great and the quality of the image isn't fantastic. So all I can make out that th the sign says is, I am the only one who can tell the value of the keys and the country of the piece, something, something. Maybe it's fitting that my own sight and vision fails when confronted with this ancient sign. There's even two different angles of this bloke out there that Medell took, but in each case, I can't read the words properly. There's no such problem with the sign in the next photograph that I found, which is by my favourite photographer, Louis Fora. Uh, but it's also one of the most heartrending and tragic ones that I've seen. It's so powerful that it doesn't even include most of the blind person, certainly not his face. Fora knows that the white stick and this sign is sufficient. I am totally blind, it reads. Wounded, both eyes removed. And again, this poor bloke is trying to make ends meet by selling pencils a device that only sighted people can really use. Fora took this photo in Philadelphia in 1937. And so this man was probably a veteran of the First World War. And that's clearly a reason why there were so many blind beggars out on the streets in the first half of last century, because they had been left that way by war and conflict. Um, and on the subject of war and conflict, I'm going to pause uh, here for a moment and digress slightly by showing you uh, a truly astonishing photograph, but also uh, it's quite a shocking photograph. So if you're at all squeamish, I recommend you look away now. This one is by Percy Hennell, who was a British photographer, and it's called Wartime Injury of the Left Eye, which has been removed and replaced with a flap of skin taken from the scalp or forehead, which is bandaged. Hennel was a surgical photographer during World War II, and I think that this is a later photograph of the same patient. And so you can see that the end result was quite a bit improved. So coming back to uh, the photographs of blind people with signs uh, out in the streets, that that last Louis Fora one I showed you was from 1937 and he was selling pencils. And quite astonishingly, this is a practice that continued right up until the 1960s or 70s. So here's Gary Weidegrand who took this photograph in New York City in 1963 of a blind and deaf man selling pencils on the street. And his sign reads, I am blind and deaf, please take a pencil. Anything you give will help me. Thanks and God bless you. My dog's name is Lady. You can't really see the dog though. Its ears are just about visible at the bottom of frame there. Ten years after that, still in New York City, Paul McDonough took these two photographs. The first one is fairly absurd in that here we have a blind man with a sign that reads, I am blind, will you please help me, thank you and God bless you. But the man is being accosted by a Hare Krishna devotee who remarkably seems to be trying to get this blind man to look at her leaflet, which is truly amazing. And I simply love this other woman's eye in the background here as she gives her a real withering look as she passes. 
functioning eyes, not just blind ones, are always incredibly powerful in street photography. This wasn't the only blind beggar photograph that McDonough took, though. He also did this one, which has Harry Krishna's in it again. What are the odds of that? Fortunately, this one isn't trying to get the blind bloke to read a leaflet, although he is being subjected to some drumming and chanting. So when I started this segment, I said that there were two different types of blind beggar photographs out there. And this next one uh, very neatly straddles both categories. It was taken by Edith Tudor Hart, um, about whom I'm going to do an entire episode soonish, honestly, uh, in London in 1935. And it shows a blind accordion player with a sign on his head which reads, In Total Darkness. So another quietly devastating sign, but it also introduces the next category, which is blind musicians. And the main type of blind musician is the blind accordionist. And there are loads and loads of these. I don't know why so many blind people learn to play the accordion. Uh, maybe if someone does know, they can tell me down in the comments. Here is a great photograph of a blind accordion player on the New York subway taken by Walker Evans in 1938. A photograph in which just about everyone apart from Evans seems to be ignoring the blind beggar and paying him no attention at all. Now, keep that image in your mind and compare it with this one by Bruce Davidson, which was also taken on the New York subway, but this time more than 40 years later in 1980. Davidson gets a lot closer here and he's obviously using a flash and the subway carriage is now a far different type of place, covered in graffiti with this bloke here who might be sleeping or passed out but some elements remain the same. The accordion, obviously, but also both blind musicians have tied a metal cup or can to their instrument to collect the money. I'm very quickly just gonna look at two more blind accordion photos before we move on. The first one is this, taken by Marketa Luskakova in Portobello, uh, London in 1975, of a man called Blind Bob. Luskakova did a whole project on buskers, and I particularly love the way that she's included her own shadow here. Bob's tin, you'll notice, is not tied to his accordion, but placed down at his feet. And the final blind accordion photograph is by Show and Tell's old friend Andre Cortez from 1959. And this is a double whammy in that Cortez has managed to get a dwarf putting a coin in a blind couple's collection cup on 6th Avenue. Now, keen-eyed students out there might be able to spot that this charitable dwarf is not just any old dwarf, but is in fact none other than Jimmy Armstrong the famous subject of Bruce Davidson's circus project from 1958, and an extra photography point for this bloke in the background watching the whole thing going down. So that's blind beggars and musicians, and the next category that I want to look at is portraits, portraits of the blind. Now, I haven't been able to find as many of these as I hoped, um, and I dare say that there's lots that I've missed, but interestingly, uh, just in the same way that uh, Bruce Davidson and Audrey Cortez uh, photographed the same dwarf. So uh, the next portrait that I want to look at, the main portrait I want to look at, uh, which is by both uh, Richard Avedon and Diane Arbus, who doubled up on the same blind subject. And that is the great Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. So Arbus did him first, and here he is in Central Park looking slightly put out, if you ask me. Arbus was known to be quite demanding, and to me, this photo looks as if Borges is reaching the end of his tether with her demands. Although equally, you can see why Arbus would want to photograph him, other than it just being an assignment. His eyes are obviously wrong. They don't engage with the camera. They point off in different directions. And you can imagine that Arbus probably quite liked this. It gives the portrait an unsettling, almost surreal quality. Borges is posing for the camera as much as he can, but he has no control over where his eyes go. And who knows, maybe also as to where his mind is wandering. But now, contrast Arbus's portrait with this one by Richard Avenden, taken a few years later in 1975. This is a very different piece of work. It's in a studio for a start, and Borges seems as if he's trying to stare at the photographer here, almost to guess at where Avenden might be standing, but he can't quite get it right. Although again, the most arresting aspect is Borges's sightless eyes, which have a mind of their own. Avenden said, I photograph what I'm most afraid of. And obviously blindness is the absolute terror of any photographer. There's another Avenden portrait I'd like to briefly look at here, which also leads nicely into a whole separate category. And that's this great shot of the film director, John Ford, who as you can see was blind in one eye. He also has a blacked out lens in his glasses and the eye patch. However, unlike Borges, his one good eye is staring rather scarily straight at the photographer. 
And this is a good way of getting into a whole subset of blind photographs, which is eye patches or eye injuries. So we can go from Avenden's John Ford to this one by Cecil Beaton of the fantastically named Lieutenant General Adrian Carton de Wiert from 1943. And just as with John Ford, when someone only has one eye, it's almost as if that good eye looks twice as hard at the photographer. Bruce Gilden has a couple of great eye patch photographs from New York City, and there's plenty and plenty of others. In fact, I would almost argue that the partially blind eye patch photo has come to replace the old blind beggar photo, which is an indication of societal progress, I think. It's no longer acceptable in the modern world to have blind people begging to survive. And various medical advances mean there's more and more people having corrective eye surgery and walking around with eye patches and patches over their eyes and street photographers are out there to pho photograph and document this. You know, street photography over time becomes a way of seeing how society changes. Um, certainly when I look back through my own archive of photographs, I don't have many photographs I've taken of blind people. What I do have is quite a few photographs of people with eye patches. So yeah, I've got far more photographs of people with eye patches on than I have of blind people. Um, and they culminate in my favourite eye patch photo that I took last year, which says, and we come unseen on this bloke's t-shirt. And we come unseen could certainly be the motto or at least the ambition of most street photographers. In actual fact, we come unseen or we came unseen is the motto of the submarine corps. So I want to show you just three more uh, photographs of blind people out in public, not begging. Um, and the first one is this by Joel Mywitz. This is from 1971, which literally shows the blind leading the blind. Then there's this uh, fantastic one by Paul Buscato, which uh, takes that previous shot, doubles it, and is almost like a mirror image. And finally, there's this one by Todd Gross, which is grimly humorous and seems like a fitting metaphor for life. So there's just one last category of blind photograph I want to show you, and it's probably the least well known, and it's something I just stumbled across fortuitously while I was doing my research. Um, but the bizarre thing to me is that I found uh, two uh, of these projects which took place almost simultaneously, but were happening on different sides of the Atlantic in the UK and America at almost the same time. So I'm gonna show you the British one first because it's slightly earlier. And these are photographs from around 1913 that were taken in the Sunderland Museum, which is in the north of England, which show blind children and some adults being allowed to feel and touch specimens and exhibits in the museum's collection so they can get a sense of what certain creatures or objects are actually like. Now, I have to confess that I'm not entirely sure who took these photos. The sessions were organised by someone called John Alfred Charlton Diaz, who was definitely the curator who came up with this, at the time, revolutionary and very progressive idea. But there's no real credit for the photos, and so I'm having to assume that he was also the photographer, but I could be wrong. Whoever took them, though, we are to be grateful, because they are just fantastic. Diaz said that to the blind, their fingers are their eyes. And so here you can see blind people becoming acquainted with a variety of objects, from a walrus to a polar bear, and even an emu or a pig. And Diaz explained that one of the main purposes was to help blind people get a sense of scale so that they could comprehend how large or small something actually was, which is a very difficult fact to convey to a blind person, but one which sighted people just take for granted. It wasn't just animals, though. There were also pictures of them discovering sculptures and toy trains and then, rather worryingly, guns. I don't know if these photographs were meant to be funny, but if you have my sense of humour, then they most certainly are. So that was Sunderland in the UK in 1913. And from just a year later, we have these amazing photographs from America, from the Museum of Natural History, from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And this time we know who the photographer was. It was someone called Julius Kirshner. And this was obviously an initiative that went on at the museum for some time because their archives have photographs that date right up until the late 1920s, some of which were taken by another photographer called H.S. Rice. What I love about these images is not just the bizarre aspect of seeing people hugging giant stuffed hippos or globes or leopards, although that is all great. It's more to do with when these photographs were taken, over 100 years ago from 1914 onwards. 
So these images taken in museums are exactly contemporary with the street photographs I showed you earlier of blind people out in the world begging. But these ones tell a very different story. These blind people are being educated and helped. They're not having to flog pencils or play the accordion for pennies. Street photography is a fantastic thing, but it will only ever give you one part of the story. It would be wrong for us to look back on the past and assume that it was only harsh to the blind because of the evidence we find out on the street. Inside, it transpires, there was a kinder, more inclusive history taking place, as we can see from these remarkable images. That's it for this episode. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Um, if this is the first episode of Show and Tell you've ever seen, then uh, there are 17 more uh, to look back and uh, delight yourself with. And uh, very, very few of them feature images of traumatized eyes and there's a lot more jokes. So yeah, maybe worth having a look back through uh, the archives and seeing what you can find. Um, also, just a very, very quick thank you again to everyone who helped me uh, with my recent Kickstarter for my book, Mostly False Reports. Um, that ended up at being 120% finance, so it's definitely gonna happen, woo! And uh, hopefully the book will be out at the end of this year. Uh, that's it, thanks for watching, and I'll be back soon with another show and tell. Bye.